we thought it'd be a great time to pull together Cognition's generative AI expert team, as you can see right in front of me, and put together a Gen AI series where we will break down what Gen AI is, how it relates to current events. We're going to share some use cases, chats about security and ethics, and then we're going to wrap on up with the future of AI and where this can all go. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce you to these three experts who I'm sure you've all seen before, but starting out, Christina Torres, we have Jameson Ducey and Charles Dunn. Let's get to the technical stuff. So Jameson, let's start out with you. Can you explain to me and the audience, let's pretend that I'm five years old, right? What is generative artificial intelligence? Excellent question. It's kind of a broad question for sure, but just to start off with, I'd kind of like to um, explain the division between AI, just normal artificial intelligence and Gen AI. I think that's a good little lead in um, for all of us five-year-olds out there, including me. I was once a five-year-old as well. Um, Gen AI is um, in context with artificial intelligence Gen AI is any kind of artificial intelligence that can generate new or novel content. Now, the big sort of hinge word there is going to be new or novel. And that's really what's been changing throughout the, the past pretty much better part of a century, honestly, since AI and Gen AI both came about. So artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s or so, and generative AI has also been around since the 1950s, but not in the same shape that we see it today. Uh, we had chatbots in the 50s. Eliza was one of the first chatbots that was meant to mimic a human psychiatrist, but they used, Eliza used a rule-based program. Whereas nowadays with the Gen AI that we see today, we're using what we call deep learning, which is a type of algorithm that mimics the structure of the human brain with neurons passing information to each other back and forth, making little information loops and basically attempting to mimic intelligence artificially, right, via that particular process. And that has really only started picking up speed recently because of advances in hardware and because of one of the newer architectures of these deep learning networks known as the transformer, which came out uh, in 2017 in a research paper called Attention is All You Need by a lot of different researchers, a lot of whom actually work at Google's DeepMind now. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's the main gist that we're talking about here is, is the more recent Gen AI stuff as it comes into the public sphere. Um, all of these new large language models, all of these image generators, the video generators that are coming out nowadays, that is all generative AI. But it's been around for a pretty long time at the moment. It's just the most recent advances have pushed it more into being able to be reproducible in the technology sector. And that's what we're seeing. So interesting. And before we get to our next question, so you're, if the technology was there and, and the hardware was there, this is something that could have occurred decades ago is what you're kind of inferring. The knowledge at least was around. It was theory. So in, in the, in the scientific field of AI that started in the fifties, people have been playing around with this concept of deep learning via something called a perceptron. Uh, but we haven't been able to actually utilize um, that kind of idea until recently because of the hardware. So if we had the hardware a lot earlier, then we probably would have had Gen AI make its way into the public sector a lot earlier. But because of that restriction, we weren't able to test out our ideas as easily as we wanted to within the research sector. So we were a bit held back by the hardware for sure. But because of that, it's kind of a feedback loop a little bit. Since we were hard, held back by the hardware, we weren't able to flesh out any of those ideas into what we have today. So they sort of feed off of each other a little bit. Makes sense. So we'll talk about hardware a little bit more shortly, but kind of getting the gist of this all is this is not a surprise for people who've been in the field. It was just kind of the, the catch up piece that is where we are now. So let's talk about more 
of the kind of the main players in the space. So now that Jameson gave us a nice breakdown, we understand the difference between AI and Gen AI and, and where we are at this moment. Christina, can you talk about those key companies or key large language models? What can you tell us about, say, the most popular three or four of them in the market right now? Okay, so in terms of the language models and of themselves, there's three main players, I would say, OpenAI, Google, and Anthropic. So OpenAI is the creator of ChatGPT and Sora AI, and with uh, GPT-4 and up, we're able to process text, vision, audio, and hopefully when Sora AI is released, we'll be able to bring um, video into that mix, generating video and analyzing video, which is gonna be super exciting. But OpenAI, open they plan to integrate with the Apple ecosystem very soon. So you'll be able to access the chatbot via the Siri, interacting with Siri, sending requests to the GPT model, and then Siri responding back to you or through content generation on different applications on Apple devices. So that's OpenAI, locked to Apple kind of, and they also partner with Microsoft and you'll see them appearing more on Microsoft Copilots integrated into Microsoft computers. But there's also Google with Gemini. Mm. Now, Google Gemini, different company, different language model, different training data, it's able to do very similar stuff as ChatGPT, and they also have video coming, but their main difference is that they're actually integrating with Android phones as a chat assistant there. And they also do more integrations into the Google suite as a whole. So you'll see them on Google Labs with different uh, products like video FX for creating video and like music labs for creating music. And lastly, Anthropic, they gave us Claude, and what sets Claude apart is one, they are ethically sourced and ex ethically trained. So if you are very concerned with con constitutional AI, Anthropic is the first choice. And they also offer a free model that's their mid-size tier. And mm -hmm. through that free model, you're able to process documents, images, PDF files, which isn't actually offered through Google or OpenAI for free. But Claude does it for free, which is very beneficial. Excellent. Great rundown over there. And, and uh, Anthropics Cloud is attached to Amazon uh, primarily. I believe there's a big backer of investments from them. You know, what's interesting um, is a couple of things, obviously with Apple's conference uh, just uh, recently, and you mentioned with Google, with Android, a discussion I believe I've had with all three of you is where Gen AI is really going to kind of take that next step into the stratosphere, so to speak, was when it gets integrated on your phone. We've mentioned that a lot, and now it's here. It's here, and you can actually see that Apple stock kind of went to the stratosphere as well uh, recently. The after this announcement took a, a day or two, but Christina, if it's a fair follow up question here, why is that the the next kind of uh, entry point into the uh, I guess next chapter of Gen AI being on your phone? What's so great about that? Well. The way I see it is when you have a language model, especially like in a chat bot, like chat GPT is and how you typically interact with Gemini, you really have to just be kind of like the intermediary if you want to produce anything using that language model. Mm -hmm. So like if you wanted to like produce code using just the chat interface, then you'll have to do some back and forth with the model, sending it the code that you write and like, you know, describing your ecosystem to the model. But when you take these language models and you're able to integrate them on phones and in applications, the model itself can directly access information, process things that like, you know, you may have missed or not even realized was going wrong. And it actually just opens up the capabilities of the model to be that much more of an assistant to you. Perfect. Yeah, that, that personal assistant piece is dealing with thousands of emails as you all have right in text messages. It's something that it's going to condense and bring to us and help us uh, simplify. So very interesting. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Last question teed up for Charles. Mm -hmm. You are the lead of the data program uh, at Cognitia. Mm -hmm. How are these LLMs that Christina just referenced and Jameson gave us the backstory on, how are they getting their data? And then why is chip capacity? Like NVIDIA's recent announcement, they're going to have more powerful chips year over year, right? Why is it so important? So a thing that is 
very important to keep in mind when you're thinking when you're thinking about any of these language models is that they don't really understand they recognize they recognize patterns they are reproducing patterns that they have see that they have been trained on and they've been trained on most of the public internet at this point we have the these these uh tools called web crawlers that go through that just follow all the all of these links on the internet all the data all the text that has been uploaded to as i said the entire internet and as Jameson was talking about with hardware, we didn't really have the hardware that could contain all of that information until very recently. And so the reason why we keep having to have these bigger and bigger chips is to hold more and more data in memory so that the model has more inputs that it can recognize and statistically significant outputs to those inputs that are that it can uh, generate for you. So these the bigger the chip, the more data it can the more data it can process, the more data it can process, the more specialized kinds of input it can recognize. There was a phrase that I saw in a discussion that transformer models are the dumbest kind of machine intelligence because all that's doing is looking at all of this data, finding patterns and regurgitating those patterns back at you. So it is a model that it's not the cleverest kind of machine learning, but it benefits from scale really well. The more hardware you can plug into one of these into one of these transformer models, the better your outputs are going to be. That was a wonderful breakdown. I have two questions. One of them actually might be silly to wrap us up here, but uh, as these chips get bigger and more powerful, it, does that also mean that they are becoming less efficient? Are they becoming more efficient? How, how's that power uh, being utilized? I know obviously more is being used, so mm -hmm. it kind of counteracts, but let's say data alone on, on one chip over the other, is it technically more efficient? I would say that probably, that is probably going to depend on the architecture. That is going to depend on the, that is going to depend on the specific kind of chip that's mm -hmm. being used. They always advertise that their that their chips are more energy efficient but the energy consumption of training models constantly goes up so from a real world perspective these data centers are always chewing up more energy soaking up more water uh, it's always like they are always using more and more and more even if the chips themselves are getting more efficient, the number of them uh, kind of counter counterbalances. It makes it makes sense, right? Yeah. I mean, they're everywhere. Everybody's using them. They get ingrained in our phones. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll talk more about that in the future uh, section. Mm -hmm. My my last question for you. This may be a silly question. With the data mostly coming from the internet, mm -hmm. uh, is there a chance that they run out of? new data like uh, i know you and i also chatted where they might just be the, the large language models might just be taking data from other previous large language model responses is yes. there a chance they're running out of just new data yes yes actually i was recently reading an article that they are were actually closer than you might think to the point where they where language models have just run out of language data to be trained on. So uh, this is something the that they're they're the phrase they're using is model collapse, where mm -hmm. models simply where the where models are trained on its own outputs, and so you end up with these these. Um, self-augmenting effects of if an output wasn't correct, well, that's the only, wasn't correct before, well, now that's the only thing that it's being trained on. That's a real problem for the future of this industry.
Right. Interesting. And when to think about how much data occurs every single year and compared to mm -hmm. the rest of the history in time, it, it's almost mind blowing to think about these large language models burning through all of that data. Mm -hmm. the amount of energy there. Th thank you, Charles. Uh, great information as always. Christina Jameson, yours as well. I'm looking forward to part number two, where we talk a little bit more about use cases, security, and ethics. For the jump, I'm Rich Bowers. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.